Hello everyone. So we are going to do um, just a review of our nervous, sensory, and locomotor system. So this is essentially chapter 27 in your textbook and uh, we'll take up unit 5 coming up after our test. So let me just get rid of this video so it doesn't take up uh, so much space in our recording and we will get started so on the screen uh, I put the date of July 12th because technically that is when unit 5 starts I know you have a test number 2 coming up for the 13th um, by the time you watch this that may already be over but technically our unit 5 starts on the 12th okay to get started a bit uh, just one question. So these questions that come up through the uh, through presentations are designed to kind of bring your attention to what may be some of the important points that we're bringing up. So if you see one of these questions and you're like, oh, I don't know what that is, well, that would be a good cue to go back to your text and make sure you do know uh, what it is before continuing on. So one good thing about recordings is you can definitely pause, play, skip ahead, skip back, however you want to watch this that it's most useful for you. So to start off, the two main divisions of our nervous system are nerves axons, sensory and motor, brain and spinal cord, or CNS and PNS. So what that stands for is central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And if you have already been reading, you know that the two main divisions of our nervous system is central nervous system, so CNS, and PNS, the peripheral nervous system. This is uh, just a drawing that kind of uh, lays that out for us. So the yellow bits, let me grab a pen here. So here your brain as well as your spinal column here makes up our CNS or our central nervous system and then all of the other nerves happening in the rest of our body outside of the brain and spinal cord so all the ones going to our muscles and our glands um, is going to be our PNS or our peripheral nervous system So this diagram is very similar to the one in the bottom of page 576 in your textbook. So this is giving kind of a, an overview, and I do like this diagram <clears throat> as it gives a nice uh, organized way of showing how our nervous system works. So it's very simplified, which I think is a nice place to start. So in this example, it gives a stimulus happening. So for here, it's going to be a stimulus happening in something that this person is seeing. So, so light in some way is traveling into their eye. Um, these, there's these sensory receptors in the eye. They're called photoreceptors at the back of your eye picking up on that stimulus. So here we have stimulus happening. So this could be anywhere um, in your body. So it could be touching something hot or in your book, the example they give is a mosquito biting you. And if you, you live uh, anywhere close to here, bugs are bad this year. <laughs> so then our nervous system kind of takes over. So our peripheral nervous system, so those nerves that are out into your body so not part of your brain or spinal cord so your sensory nerves are out there in your peripheral nervous system so down here it's showing that these sensory neurons are are traveling um, from the stimulus to bring that input into our central nervous system so this is our brain <clears throat> and sometimes often these nerves are also passing through our spinal cord so this is where integration happens. And so what does integration mean? So integration means that our brain receives this information that we have 
a stimulus happening and it makes sense of it. It decides what it is, what um, we may want to do about it, and then it sends out information about what we should do about it or what it means. And so often it starts off uh, going into our spinal cord in our central nervous system and then it's going to leave and go back out into our peripheral nervous system to tell us what we're going to do about it. So in this example, maybe the stimulus up here was actually something frightening. So it could be somebody that's afraid of snakes, sees a snake on the path in front of them during a hike. Our brain integrates this information and says, oh, I don't like that. That snake could be poisonous. We better run from here. So it sends out information back out into our peripheral nervous system. And in this case, it's going to be through a motor neuron. And it's going to tell our muscle, you better pick up the pace and run. So our muscles will start to contract and run away for us. So this diagram will correspond to any kind of stimulus. It's just a very basic way of how it works. Okay, so a neuron, this is going to be the uh, functional unit of our nervous system. So in the past we've talked about functional units before being like the alveoli in our respiratory system. It's a functional unit of our, our respiratory system. Uh, a nephron is the functional unit of our urinary system. So here in the nervous system our functional uh, unit is the neuron. So they can look different um, but this example or this diagram is kind of a basic of how uh, many of them may look. One important thing to be aware of, and I've uh, highlighted it here, is dendrites. So this is the cell body. So many cells will look like this, kind of, you know, oval or circular in shape and then they have a nucleus and all uh, kinds of like organelles and things inside so that's very basic to most cells something that is special for neurons are these dendrites so all of these um, little branches that come off of the cell body this is what will um, carry the incoming messages toward the cell body so if a if a uh, stimulus has happened up here somewhere, stimulus, it's always going to be uh, flowing in this direction. So it will be carried through these dendrites into the cell body. And then it will continue on. So we'll talk a little bit about how that even happens. Like how does this message continue on along here? but this is the direction it's going. Now we're back to these red arrows here until it reaches the other end of the neuron where it's going to reach these synaptic terminals. So they're always going to, in a neuron, it's always going to start up here with these dendrites that go into the cell body. One thing to kind of point out is not all neurons have this thing called a myelin sheath, but it's almost kind of like insulation. These little white bubbles along here, it's almost like insulation along the axon of the neuron. And neur neurons that have this myelin sheath, this signal will actually move quicker. Okay, so now we're getting into action potential and resting potential. So this part can be a bit confusing, but I'll try to make it as simplified as possible and still be able to understand it. So here's the question. The action potential is A, any factor that causes a nerve signal to be generated, B, a stimulus of sufficient strength which can trigger a nerve signal that carries information along a neuron, or C, only found in the brain. So if you picked B, that means you've already been studying, and that is the answer. So this is um, 
you know, I like to make the analogy between, and I think your textbook does this as well, so an action potential for a neuron is kind of similar to turning on a flashlight. So if you have a flashlight with a button that you push, if you press it just a little tiny bit, your flashlight's not going to turn off. You have to give it a significant, or you have to give it enough strength to push that button in. You'll usually hear that click, and then your flashlight will turn on. So a neuron um, is the same. So all along, so this is that axon part of the neuron right here. All along there, it, there's a cell membrane, and if you've taken the first um, part of biology, it talks about cell membranes and having different uh, charges on either side of the cell membrane, ions, then this axon is the same, being usually when it's at rest, there's a whole lot of positive ions on the outside of the membrane and a whole lot of negative ions on the inside. So it's kind of, um, it's almost like a battery that's holding a charge, but it hasn't been activated in order to work. And so when it's sitting in that resting state, we call it resting potential. So then if a stimulus comes along, so say, up here, there's a mosquito bite that happens. Um, receptors will pick that up and send the electric current along. So how does that electric current happen? So that's called action potential. So a stimulus happens. And right here it shows that a few channels will open up and allow a few positive ions to flow inside the cell membrane. Once enough of those, so the stimulus is great enough to cause enough of those positive ions to go into the center, then action potential will be reached and it will continue along the cell membrane. So that's showing these blue ions here. You know, the positive ones are going into the center of the cell membrane and this blue guy will continue along causing that electrical signal to be passed along that axon in that direction. When the signal has passed, the stimulus is finished, then resting potential is returned. So it's in that resting potential of the positive ions being outside the cell membrane and the negative ions being on the inside. So here's kind of the order of events. So on page in your textbook where it's 577 to 578 where it's talking about action potential, here's kind of a, you know, a short order of events that's happening here. So an order of events in the propagation. So if you see a word like propagation, that means like the start of a nerve signal. So number one, a stimulus occurs. So I said an example of a fly lands on your skin. So that's part of your peripheral nervous system, if you remember. So a small number of positive ions rush in. So some of those neurons, some of those positive ions will start rushing inside the cell membrane. Number three, if enough of that happens, the action potential is reached. Number four, then more positive ions rush into the cell membrane as that action potential travels along the neuron. And then once that's gone through and finished, then the membrane returns to resting potential. Okay, so now what happens after that electrical signal reaches the end of that neuron? So when the action potential reaches the end of the neuron, it A, ends its transmission, B, connects to the dendrites of the receiving cell, C, must pass across the synaptic cleft, or D, will reverse its direction and return back up the axon. So if you remember back a few slides, I talked about the dendrites passing that message to the cell body. But before it can get to those dendrites, it actually has to pass across a synaptic cleft. So this information is located on page 579 of your textbook.
And this is one of the diagrams it gives to explain it. So in this example, it shows one neuron here connecting to another neuron. So in order to continue that electrical transmission of that message, in this example, it's going from one neuron to another. And so it's showing the dendrites here of the receiving neuron. And here's the end of the other neuron. So in between there, there's a space. So this is the end of one neuron, this is the dendrite of another, and in here is that space, so called that synaptic cleft. So in your book it talks a little bit about, you know, a couple of different ways that can happen. In this example it's actually showing um, a chemical version of how it can happen. So the it has number one, the action potential arriving. So that's that electrical signal arriving to the end of the neuron. And in this neuron, it has something called a neurotransmitter. So that's like a chemical that can be given off. So it's stimulated to kind of fuse with the bottom of the end of this neuron. And the neurotransmitter, so that chemical, is released into the synaptic cleft. It actually stimulates these receptors on the receiving neuron. So then it's going to cause all of these ion channels to open. So again, there's more channels opening to allow ions through. And it's going to trigger a new action potential in the next neuron. Okay, so if we're going to touch, so we talked about the the nervous system being divided into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system consists of what? A, the brain, B, the spinal cord, C, both of the above, or D, the sensory neurons. So if you remember, it's both. So central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. That's what makes it up. On page 583, there's a diagram similar to this one on the screen of your brain. So I would suggest kind of being familiar with what, you know, the major structures in your brain do really. So for example, um, knowing that, you know, this part of your well, here it's called, they call it your hindbrain, or um, you, your brain stem is generally um, what we refer to it as. So, for example, knowing that your brain stem does things like controls breathing, uh, circulation, swallowing, digestion, so a lot of those kind of vital functions that need to be regulated without you even thinking about them happens here in the brain stem. So the hypothalamus we will get into and the pituitary gland we'll get into a little bit more in the endocrine unit. So for this unit you don't really have to worry about those two guys but this is kind of where the connection happens. So our, our body communicates in a couple of different ways. So the nervous system is one way, but also our endocrine system and hormones is the other way. So they are very much connected. And actually the hypothalamus is one of those connection points where our nervous system will talk to our endocrine system. So in that diagram back here, this is the cerebellum. So this guy will coordinate body movement. So often a injury that happens here at the back of the head could make someone uh, make it really difficult to keep balance and that sort of thing. So cerebral cortex is important up here. So this is kind of like the, the cerebrum, which is kind of the main 
when if you think of the brain and all of this uh, squiggly material that happens here, the main part of that brain is actually a cerebrum, but the cerebral cortex is just the outer layer has a lot of very important functions, so like learning, speech, emotions, um, behavior, like complex behavior like art and that sort of thing is responsible in the cerebral cortex. So that's just that outer layer that happens, that outer layer over your brain. So knowing those kind of basics of the brain is important. So if you remember back here, The peripheral uh, nervous system was divided into our, our input and our output, generally. So the output component, so after our brain has made sense of things and sends signals back out to our body, it goes back out to our peripheral nervous system, it's divided into two components. So let me see if I can find your page numbers here. Page 582 if you're looking for the answer for this book, or answer for this question, sorry. So the peripheral nervous system is divided into two functional or main components. So it's actually going to be the motor system and the autonomic nervous system. So if you like um, mind maps or concept maps, I do like it for the nervous system because it can get kind of confusing all these divisions that are happening. So we started off with our main nervous system and it div we divided it up into our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system. So we were talking about the central nervous system being made up of our brain and our spinal cord. So if we go out to the peripheral nervous system, so that's all the nerves in the rest of your body outside of the brain and spinal cord, we have now divided it, it into two different systems. So we have the motor system, which would, would be like control of your skeletal muscles. So that's voluntary. And then this one, the autonomic system. So the this is involuntary. So that's kind of a a main difference between these two things. So I'll just I'll add that in here. So motor system is voluntary. Our autonomic system is involuntary, meaning we don't necessarily have control over it. It happens automatically. So further, we are going to actually divide the autonomic system, so this involuntary one, into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So one, so kind of an easy way to remember these two is sympathetic is actually fight or flight. So those are the things that happen when you get scared. So your heart rate increases, your body kind of forgets about digestion for a bit and because you have more important things to worry about. So your breathing might increase, your heart rate increases, and you get ready to actually, so it's usually when you're scared, for example. You're going to be ready to fight something off or you're going to be ready to run away. So more oxygen is going to be used for your muscles to run And then parasympathetic. Let me get my. All right, this one's more like rest and digest. So our body can worry about resting and digesting our food when we're not scared. So um, our heart rate is lowered some, our breathing is in control and our body can just relax and do things like digest our food.
This is just a chart that shows you know, another way of looking at the peripheral nervous system and how it's divided. So on this side you have, let me grab my pen, on this side you have the motor system, so the voluntary one, like your leg muscles, and over here the autonomic one, so sympathetic and parasympathetic, so fight and flight, or rest and digest, so kind of the opposites of each other there. And this is the chart that's given in your book that further divides the autonomic nervous system into parasympathetic and sympathetic. Okay, so part of your starting on 587, we start to get into the senses and how that's part of the input, um, part of that first diagram we talked about. So kind of all of the receptors and nerves that are picking up things like what you see and what you hear, smell, touch, taste. Your textbook does get into a fair amount of detail as far as how vision works and how the eye is made up and how hearing works and kind of the structures involved with hearing. I would say that, you know, it's good to be aware that seeing and hearing are part of those senses and part of that uh, sensory input in our peripheral nervous system. But I feel like in your textbook this goes into too much detail. So the section on lighting the retina, 589, all the way up to the end of hearing on 592. I mean, read through it once, but don't worry about studying those major terms and everything happening in there. I will review, however, so this concept of sensory transduction, so that's the what happens when you get a stimulus signal and it then it's converted to an electrical signal and this happens with a receptor cell. So your senses, all your different senses have these different receptor cells associated with them that will change that stimulus into an electrical signal. So I'll talk about that a bit more on the next slide. So, so because neurons have action potentials. These receptors in our senses have receptor potentials. So it happens in a similar way, but it can vary in intensity. So if you eat a food that has a little bit of salt in it, your brain will eventually integrate that that's a bit salty. But if you eat something that is full of salt, though that will increase the intensity of that stimulus and it will pick up. Uh, your brain will integrate that that's extremely salting, salty thanks to the, this receptor potential. So the fact that it can vary in intensity. So again, sensory transduction, so converting one type of signal to an electrical signal. So this is, is an example of a receptor cell that would be in your tongue. So here it's showing some sugar molecules. So let's say you're eating a very sweet popsicle. So you have these sugar molecules as the stimulus that are attaching to the receptor on this receptor cell. So inside again we have some you know some ions changing place to kind of uh, create that sensory transduction. And in this example it's actually stimulating a neurotransmitter so that chemical signal is being released from the receptor cell which is triggering in this sensory neuron. So again, we're back to the neuron. So it's going to trigger that action potential in this neuron that will eventually send the signal to your brain that you are eating a very sweet, sugary popsicle. So there are page 588. It talks about different types of sensory receptors.
So those receptors that will pick up that stimulus that's happening and then change it to an electrical signal. So this diagram shows some of the major ones. So this one is a picture of your skin, for example, and it show, it's showing all the different um, sensory receptors happening just in your skin alone. So we have a couple here that will pick up heat and cold. So these are called thermoreceptors. We have lots of pain receptors that will pick up the stimulus of pain. We even have uh, two different receptors and these are called mechanoreceptors that will pick up um, information about like if you're touched lightly so if like a, a fly lands on your skin or one mechanoreceptor that will detect strong pressure so if something is very pushing on your skin in a deep way um, mechanoreceptors uh, there are also ones that will detect things like stretching and motion and sound even A couple of other receptors that aren't noted in this diagram, so, um, but in the last one we talked about, so chemoreceptors, so that's actually what this one would be considered on your tongue, so it's actually picking up, you know, chemicals in your environment, like food you're eating or um, things you're smelling. And then the eye is talked about in, in your textbook, so in vision, so that would be like an electromagnetic receptor, which is sensitive to, to energy or uh, wavelengths, so sometimes magnetism, like if you can feel that you're close to a strong magnet, or light. So those would be like the photoreceptors at the back of your eye. Okay, so again, kind of skipping over those pages that go into a lot of depth with vision and hearing. On page 593, we start to get into your locomotor system. So if you go think back to that first simple diagram, your peripheral nervous system, so there's the sensory input, and then at the bottom is the, the motor output. And so one so movement is a major part of this. And our nervous system is what is issuing commands to those muscles to, to run or swat away that bug. And it's actually what makes an animal be able to move its parts. So part of, like a major player in this is our skeletal system. So, you know, it provides three kind of main, main things. So anchoring, so their skeletal system gives a spot for our muscles to anchor. So those, you know, tendons are actually attaching to an anchoring around our skeleton. Support. So without support, for example, of like our pelvic girdle, a lot of our lower abdominal organs would sink down to where they shouldn't be. And then we also have protection. So things like our ribs protect very vital organs like our heart so that we can do things like play soccer without worrying about getting our heart damaged directly by a soccer ball. So one question here, the axial skeleton. So our skeleton is actually divided up into two parts, um, one being the axial and one the other part being the appendicular. So the axial skeleton consists of skull, vertebral column and ribs, arm, leg bones, and pelvic girdle. All the long bones are all bones of the body. So it's actually A. So our axial kind of those center supporting structures like our skull, our vertebrae along our, that go over top of our spine, around our spine, and our ribs is our axial skeleton. In this diagram, 
which is similar to the one in your textbook on 594. All this green, all the skeletal parts that are green are axial, and all the yellow are appendicular. So I wouldn't panic with all of these names of your bones. I, I won't ask you necessarily to be able to know or list these type all these bones, but there are some basics to bones that you should be aware of. Um, one of these basics is how they connect to one another. So various types of joints are at the bottom of 594. So one question here is the joint at your hip that holds your leg to your pelvis is an example of A, a pivot joint, B, a hinge joint, C, ball and socket joint, or D, a suture. And so the answer to this one is actually ball and socket, which allows things, um, which like the shoulder and the hip, that allows it to rotate in many different directions. So that's ball and socket. Um, another type of joint is our, a hinge joint, so that can move um, back and forth in a single direction. So when you're doing like a bicep curl, if you're lifting weights, that is using your hinge joint at your elbow. And then a pivot joint, so an example of this one, is in your wrist. So you can actually turn, rotate your arm so that your palm is facing down or facing up, and that's thanks to the pivot joints in your wrist. So there's a brief section there that talks about you know the structure of your bones and one connection between this and the immune system which you've just finished is all of our long bones so all of the big bones in our body have something in the center called yellow bone marrow. So for example, the long bones in our leg, our upper leg and our lower leg, and also in our arms, will have this uh, yellow bone marrow in the center of it, which is very important in creating and housing some white blood cells. Okay, so the muscular system, so 596, so getting into the nitty gritty of how a muscle works can be a bit confusing, so I'll try to kind of simplify it down a bit for you. So skeletal muscles are the ones that are attached to your skeleton, and they provide body movement, so they're the voluntary ones. When we talked about tissues back in chapter 21, we talked about the different types of muscle tissues, so being cardiac, smooth muscle, and skeletal muscle. So um, this time we're going to talk about the muscles, or the muscular ones, the skeletal muscles, sorry. In this diagram, it's showing this bicep muscle contracting and relaxing. So this bicep muscle contracts. Uh, this tendon here is actually connected to your lower arm. And so by this muscle shortening, so that's what it does, it gets shorter, it will actually pull up the lower part of your arm based on how it's connected here to your bones in your lower arm. So that's how a lot of your skeletal muscles work all over your body. Okay, so getting into kind of the cellular basis of how muscle contracts, so really at a small cellular, cellular level, this question, a sarcomere, so that's the functional unit of a muscle. Again, we're back down to that functional unit, like a neuron being the functional unit of the nervous system. So the functional unit of a muscle is composed of regular arrangements of two kinds of filaments. So the answer here is actually B, actin and myosin. And it's also talked about in your textbook as being like these thin and thick filaments. So in this diagram, it actually shows these red guys here being those thick filaments. 
and blue being the thin filaments, so myosin and actin, these filaments. So essentially what's happening here, it's showing, you know, we're having bundles of muscle fiber, then it's showing just a single muscle cell being these long guys here. Inside there we have these even smaller bands called myofibrils. And then these myofibrils are actually made up of these thick and thin filaments, these myosin and actin filaments. And so essentially how does a muscle work? So it happens at this very, very tiny level down here. And a myosin head, so the red guys, have these little projections off of them. So one of them would be called a myosin head. And it actually reaches out using energy to attach to the actin, so the thin filaments. And then it pulls these blue thin filaments in. So essentially a myosin head attaches to the actin filament and then pulls it toward the center. So these blue guys get pulled toward each other and that's actually what's shortening the muscles and allowing the muscle to contract. So to sum that, so that's kind of the sum, the summary of that chapter. And I would like to give you an opportunity to do a bonus project. Now you may be thinking, no way, I have no time for this. And that's okay, you don't have to. But if you feel like you have time, you can. So it's really a mindfulness project. So because our nervous system has such a huge impact on our body, which, and also our endocrine system, which we'll talk about as well. So this project is to kind of select one of those mindfulness practice, so meditation or yoga, etc., and do some research on how it actually impacts the body. So write a sh a sh do a short write-up, a video, a presentation on what you learn about that. So it could be just really a paragraph or two. So once you select one of those practices, try it out for seven days. So try something you've never tried before even. So after each day, note any observations that you make and then write a short reflection about your experience. So with what you learned about how it impacts the body and your reflection, you can send that to me by email before July 20th and I'll actually give you an extra point or a 1% on your final grade. So if you're like, no way, I'm not doing that, that's totally fine. Don't feel pressured that you have to do it, but it's out there in case um, you're interested. So please remember if you have any questions or need something reviewed specifically, please ask in the Q&A board for Unit 5. And, uh, you know, if you haven't yet done test number two, good luck. And if you're already done, I hope it went well for you. And I will talk to you later.